This week, a week after Israel's second round of national elections in less than a year, the part chess, part chicken game of forming Israel's next government is on. The political gridlock is so bad, though, that an anchor on Israel's Channel 2 News joked that aliens visiting Israel and forming a government would be less weird than the current situation. I'm Lev Gringaus, and welcome to The Jews Are Tired, your podcast about Jewish news. All right, so here are the two things you need to know about Israel's post-election mess, keeping in mind that we're cutting out a lot of math. Number one, everything is based on the Knesset, which is Israel's parliament, And number two, absolutely nobody knows what is going on. Okay, so back to the Knesset. There are 120 seats in the Knesset, and in order to form a government, a coalition of political parties needs to have a majority of 61 seats or more. Suffice it to say that after Tuesday's election, neither the right-wing bloc of parties nor the center and left-wing bloc of parties has that Knesset majority. So there's only one hope for a stable government and avoiding a third round of national elections. And no, it's not Luke Skywalker. The two largest parties, the centrist Blue and White with 33 Knesset seats and the right-wing Likud with 31 Knesset seats, could form what's called a national unity government on their own with 64 seats. But the head of Blue and White, Israel's former chief of staff, Benny Gantz, and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who leads Likud, aren't getting along. Gantz wants a unity government with Likud, the party, but without Netanyahu, the guy, who is under investigation in three corruption cases. Netanyahu, meanwhile, won't leave Likud and wants to keep being prime minister. So this chaos has sort of a referee. This week, Israel's president, Reuven Rivlin, is indulging in one of his few non-ceremonial roles, choosing who gets first dibs to try and form a governing coalition. And if first dibs fail, he also chooses who gets second dibs. Rivlin has until next Wednesday, October 2nd, to pick either Gantz or Netanyahu to form a government. October 2nd, incidentally, is also the date for Netanyahu's pre-indictment hearing about those three corruption cases he's involved in. Fun, right? So, here, the delicateness of politics really comes into play. Rivlin is pushing both Gantz and Netanyahu to set aside differences for a unity government. Likud members, meanwhile, have long murmured about rising up and replacing Netanyahu, but have so far been afraid to do so. So, let's say if Rivlin waits until October 2nd, gives Gantz the first try to form a government, and Netanyahu's hearing goes terribly for him, maybe Likud members will rebel and form a unity government with Gantz's blue and white party without Netanyahu. Or at least, that is the blue and white pipe dream. But at this point, it's just wild speculation and pretty unlikely. To make things weirder, leaks in the press from both Likud and Blue and White point to neither Gantz nor Netanyahu wanting to take first dibs on forming a government. They both think that if the other guy goes first and inevitably fails, then I'll have an easier time negotiating with the parties to join my coalition. But it gets even stranger. Netanyahu got his right-wing bloc of parties to sign a pledge that they will all negotiate together, which Gantz and Blue and White reject. So now you've got Likud saying they're negotiating for a unity government with blue and white plus Likud's whole right-wing bloc. And blue and white is like, hmm, funny, but no, we're only negotiating with Likud. So who knows what'll happen? Most likely another round of elections. The other interesting part of the post-elections craziness, though, somewhat of a saga on the side to all this, is the story of the joint list which is the far-left coalition of Arab-Israeli, Palestinian, and communist parties. The joint list has long been on the fringes of Israeli politics, stuck in the opposition and seen more as uncooperative troublemakers than legitimate democratic partners by Israelis and Israeli parties. Some of their members have actively supported terrorism and terrorist groups, so doubly so no Israeli party wants anything to do with them. But the joint list is still the strongest representative of Arab-Israeli voices in the Knesset. And after Netanyahu's near-constant incitement and racism and hate speech against Arab-Israelis over the past few years of elections, last Tuesday, Arab-Israelis showed up and voted the joint list into the Knesset with 13 seats, making them the third largest party in the Knesset, after Blue and White and Likud. Now, 
Arab Israelis didn't vote for the joint list, so the joint list can keep being a loud fringe group. A recent study by the Israel Democracy Institute shows that 76% of Arab Israelis want the joint list to join the government, and 58% think that Arab Israeli political leadership does not do a good job in representing the community. So all of this adds up to Arab Israelis wanting the joint list to actually be involved and represent their voice in the political process. And the joint list is listening. Coming back to President Rivlin's ability to pick whether Gantz or Netanyahu form a government first, it's traditional that the president does so based on the number of parties and their Knesset seats that endorse a particular candidate. Again, traditional but not a mandatory part of the process. Still, Netanyahu with his right-wing bloc has a 55-seat recommendation. Gantz originally had only a 44-seat recommendation from the center and center left-wing bloc, so Netanyahu had the upper hand. But then the joint list decided to endorse Gantz. The first time Arab-Israeli parties have recommended a prime minister since Itzhak Rabin in 1992. That's 27 years for anyone counting. When announcing the decision, Ayman Odeh, the head of the joint list, tweeted a line from Psalms in Hebrew saying, The rock rejected by the builders has become the capstone, alluding to the way Arab-Israelis are ostracized in Israeli society and Netanyahu's incitement against them. So if we add the joint list to Gantz's number of recommendations to the president, we get 54 seats to Netanyahu's 55. At the last moment, a party in the joint list with three seats refused to endorse, so only 10 of the 13 seats is being counted here. I know, crazy Israeli politics. But still, this is a huge moment for the joint list, partly because of the visibility they're now getting, and partly because Gantz is now on equal footing with Netanyahu for recommendations but it's important to note that the joint list is still just being pragmatic. By endorsing Gantz, they're trying to get rid of Netanyahu, but they don't get anything in return for the endorsement, and they still don't like Gantz all that much. As the third largest party in the Knesset, the best they'll get, if a unity government is formed, is a joint list-led opposition in the Knesset. That would be the first time that the opposition is led by Arab Israelis, putting them center stage in Israel's political process. All right, so that's a lot about Israel craziness. Let's pivot to the second story I want to bring you this week, which is one that shines a light on one of the deepest and least discussed fears in the Jewish community. On Friday night, as Shabbat was coming in, a rabbi in New York was arrested by the FBI on charges of producing and possessing child pornography. Rabbi Jonathan Skolnick was an assistant principal of the Middle School of SAR Academy, a well-known and well-respected modern Orthodox school in New York City. Before that, he worked for several years at another Orthodox school, the Yeshiva of Flatbush in Brooklyn. Skolnick posed as different teenage girls to get teenage boys to send him naked photos of themselves. Now, look, let's just take a moment to pause, because this is pretty terrible. And parents, students, teachers, administrators, a lot of people have been shocked by this. And the reason I'm bringing you this story is not just to say that it happened, but to take a broader view here, which unfortunately we have to do. Because while here, thankfully, no one was physically hurt in any way, the Jewish community, like any other community, has an issue of sexual abuse and this kind of behavior happening. And oftentimes, there is a pattern that emerges. For anyone who knows about sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, the notable detail is that priests who were known to be predators were simply shuffled around to different communities by church leadership without the communities being told what these priests had done previously. This exposed a lot more people to the possibility of being abused. The Jewish community hasn't had the kind of reckoning yet that the church has had, but it's well known among Jewish experts on sexual abuse that this same pattern of shuffling predators around has been going on for years. Most notably in Orthodox communities, where rabbis will just send a problematic teacher or rabbi to another community, and sometimes even around the world like in the case of Malka Lefer, a woman who sexually abused dozens of girls as an Orthodox school teacher and principal, and was shuffled between Israel and Australia and then back to Israel, where she is now in court for what she's done. In court and yet still supported by the rabbis who sent her around. Let's not forget, though, versions of this story have also happened in the conservative Jewish community and in the reformed Jewish community. The Jewish community as a whole tight-knit as it is and as we are, has a lot of inherent pressure to keep things like this quiet, and enough decentralized structure, like we don't have a pope at the top, to make it harder to point this out. 
And it takes some reflection on our part to see this and account for it in our communities. But I also want to leave this story with a bit of a different perspective. Because in this case, this principal at SAR Academy was not shuffled around. As far as we know right now, no one was aware of his behavior until the FBI arrested him. And in the midst of all this, suspicion and distrust of teachers and rabbis increases exponentially. But even in a moment like this, we can't lose sight of the many great teachers and rabbis we do have in our community. There's a balance to be had. Because being a teacher is incredibly hard, and most of us take that work for granted. Being a teacher is even harder when things like sexual abuse are hanging in the air. So, here's what Yehuda Kurtzer, president of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America and a parent in the SAR Academy community, took to Facebook to say, I'm just quoting a section here, but I think you'll get the idea. Kurtzer wrote, quote, To be teachers of children right now is to live with clouds of suspicion over the profession, even as they tend to be people with unbelievable sincerity. It is to be the kinds of people who have to stay committed to optimism, the people who can see the future and are working to build it, and to do what might be our society's most important work, with the promise of mostly just spiritual rewards. Pretty unbelievable and certainly indispensable, end quote. So as with all things, nuance and balance are everything. And now to wrap things up, I want to share a funnier story that made the rounds on Twitter last week. So everyone knows the cream cheese company Philadelphia, right? Well, they released this horrible machine called Bagel Vat. The Bagel Vat machine is designed to punch a hole in any bread-like material, and the advertising shows a hole punched in a slice of bread, not even toasted bread, and calling that slice of bread a bagel. They've got holes in pizzas, holes in omelets. I mean, it's just sick. One marketing website said that Bagel That Machine was, quote, testing the limits of cream cheese eligible services, end quote. Um, far past the limits, excuse you. And naturally, we Jews know what a bagel is, and what a bagel sure the hell isn't. So the moment we saw this, nearly every Jewish journalist started tweeting at the Anti-Defamation League, an organization well known for addressing anti-Semitism, because a lot of us feel personally attacked by this bagel that machine, and if we can't agree that this is anti-Semitism, then when are we ever going to agree about anything? This has been this week's The Jews Are Tired podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Lev Gringaus, and hopefully next week the Jews will get some rest. The Jews Are Tired is a product of Jewfolk, Inc. For more information, go to tcjewfolk.com or email the show at podcast at tcjewfolk.com.